Philemon chapter, I'm um, sorry, Philemon verses 4 through 10. There's, there's only 25 verses. Philemon verse 4 through 10. We're going to pick up in verse 6, but I want to read, get, get the flow of it here. In Philemon verse 4, I thank my God make, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ and join thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Let's go ahead and pray. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have together. Thank you for the ones that listen on the internet. And we just pray today, Lord, that we'll, as we learn more about Philemon, putting his life on display, and uh, as, as uh, he practiced the doctrine that he had in his inner man, as we read Philemon, uh, we're so thankful, Lord, that we have an opportunity each day that we're ambassadors for Christ, that we represent the Lord Jesus Christ, and we want to put our lives on display. We want people to be able to see Christ in us. We thank you for this time, for we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Looking at these verses here today, verses 4 through 10, starting verse 6, uh, displaying our lives, what I put on the board. And that, that's what uh, Philemon was doing. Paul was encouraging him to do this, to display his life because there were some issues going on. And I put on the board for you, when you read the chapter, you're going to see Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus. Plus, you're going to see Philemon's family there too. But uh, those three men there, we want to look at closely as well today. But putting your life on display, and when you, when you do that, for us as believers, uh, we're putting the doctrine in our inner man. And we're talking about, you got... Your spirit, soul, or in your body. We're made up of spirit, soul, and body. And we want to put the doctrine in our inner man. Philemon did that. And you think about the way the Paul lays Romans through Philemon out. And you, you look and see when the, where Philemon is located right before Hebrews. And you think about building that doctrine up in you. And that's what I've talked about. If you think about building up Romans through Philemon in your inner man. And then when you do that, you're, you're going to be able to practice what Philemon needed to practice for, uh, with Onesimus. Because things wasn't right between Philemon and Onesimus. Paul writes a letter, and you've, you've read that yourself, and he's encouraging Philemon there. Uh, you know, he's not commanding him, he's not making him, we're going to look at that. But look at verse 6. Paul says this, well, verse 4, he said, I thank my God making mention of thee always in my prayer. So Paul's praying for Philemon. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. Then notice that. That's the intent and purpose. Uh, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. That's the reason Paul's praying for Philemon. That word that, the intent and purpose. What, what's the reason he's praying for Philemon? You read that in verse 6 there. That the communication of thy faith. You think about communication of thy faith. What was Philemon doing when communicating his faith? He had faith. He had the doctrine in him. So what was he doing? He's talking about it. Philemon was preaching the doctrine. He's, he's giving it out to man, speaking about who he knows. He's, he's got the doctrine in him and he's giving it out. And that's the communication of thy faith. But he said there in verse 6, Philemon 6, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual. And you look at that word effectual. If you don't know what is it, what is effectual there? And a, it's, a word, it's a word describing something working inside of you. You know, that's what it is. When you think about effectual, something's working inside you. Uh, and then working outwardly. That's what effectual is because he said that the communication of our faith may become effectual. It's what's in you and it's going to work out. 
And, and the verse that I gave you last week, we'll go back and read it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. And this is how effectual works. It works inside you, then it works out. And that's what uh, Philemon, he had the doctrine inside him. Spirit and soul inside, that, uh, inside of him. He had the doctrine in him. And now he, Paul's writing to him, work it out. So 1 Thessalonians 2.13 for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you receive it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now that's what the word of God does. Uh, it tells worketh also in you that believe. When you believe it. And uh, here's an example from somebody like the Philippians, for example. Uh, they put the word in them. We're going to turn to Philippians chapter 2, if you'd like to do that. Philippians chapter 2. Here's an example of this. You put the word in you, and it works out. And you look at Philippians chapter 2 about the word effectually. And Philippians chapter 2, and look at verse 3. Philippians 2, 3. Paul says this. He says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowest of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now we're thinking about the word effectual and how, how that's used. Paul says, let nothing be done through strife. Well, what's strife? That's contention. That's opposition. That's anger. That's when you quarrel with somebody. And Proverbs 13.10 10 talks, Proverbs 13, 10 talks about contention. It's pride. It's what does the reason people do that. But he said, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Well, what's, the, what's that vain glory? All that is is empty pride. It's vain. It's empty. It's your own performance is what it amounts to. So Paul said, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. There's your spirit there, mind. Let each esteem. When you esteem somebody, you set a value on them esteem others better than themselves. And now that's an example of, of the Word working in you and the Word working out. That's what he, when he writes to the Philippians there, he's telling them, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowness of mind, your spirits in there, let, let each esteem others better than themselves. And you know what? I found that in my life. It's not always easy to practice that. But that's something there. When you put the doctrine in you, in your spirit and soul, you've got the doctrine in you, then you can do that. But if you don't have it in you, you're not going to do it. So I wanted to share that with you there. And you think about the, the communication of thy faith we read over there in verse 6. But Philippians 2, 3, this is the attitude and action that I'm supposed to take. Well, why should I take that? Why should I esteem others better than my, themselves than myself. Why should I do that? Because of who, who I am in Christ. That's why. And the question would be, Philippians 2, 3, what if you don't do that verse? And I'm going to tell you, there's many of us that don't do that verse all the time. We don't handle that verse too well. Well, what if we don't do it? You know what it amounts to? We don't believe the verse. When you don't do it, you don't believe it. People say, well, I, I do believe the verse. I read my Bible. I read. I believe what it says. But it's one thing to read it. It's one thing to believe what it says. Another thing to do it. And when you don't do it, you really you're not believing what the verse says. And that's what I'm seeing in my life now as a believer. You know, there's verses that pop up like that. Some things are hard. And you have to learn to deal with it and understand the doctrine's got to be in you or you can't do it. So, go back over there uh, to Philemon, verse 6. Philemon 6. How, when you're thinking about Philemon 6, Paul says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual. Well, how does it become effectual? Philemon 6. Or that verse there, by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. I mean, Philemon had, some, had a lot of doctrine in him. And 
What do you have to do? You've got to believe the verses. You've got the doctrine in you. You believe what you read. You practice that. And so Philemon believed the verses. What were the results of believing the verses? Then it's going to be effectual. It'll work in you. And look at verse 7. Philemon verse 7. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love because of the bowels of the saints were refreshed by thee, brother. Notice what he says there uh, about the bowels. Why were the bowels of the saints refreshed by Philemon? Well, because he believed the Scriptures. So, you know, Paul gave the Gospel to Philemon. He gave it to Onesimus. They got the doctrine from Paul. Uh, Philemon believed the, the Scriptures. He believed the doctrine. He had the doctrine built up in him. And that resulted in refreshing the saints. It, it's a, you know, whenever you work outside and you say so you mow the yard at 100 degrees and you get all hot, you need to be refreshed. With, well, I don't like cold water. I like warm water. I don't like it too cold. But I, I can drink that, and that refreshes me when I sit down. Well, that, it's the same. You think about a believer that's got the doctrine built up in you like Philemon has got the doctrine built up in him as we read this, and he can refresh the saints. Uh, and he can also refresh Paul in prison because Paul was in prison. We re we've noted that reading there because you, all you've got to do is read Philemon verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, so he's a prisoner. And how could Philemon refresh Paul? How could he refresh those believers? Well, Philemon, understand this about him. You've got Romans through Titus. You know, those books are available to him. So he's got the doctrine. So Philemon had believed the facts. And the facts, you think about the facts, you're talking about the doctrine. The doctrine of grace. Philemon understood he knew what the gospel uh, was. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He understood about the body of Christ that we're heavenly people and all that. He, he had doctrine in him. He had understanding. He had the facts is what he had. Well, also Philemon believed the facts. You can have the facts, but do you believe the facts? And by believing the facts, Philemon preached and taught the doctrine. That's how he believed the facts. Then Philemon refreshed the saints because that's proof. Because he had the facts he had the doctrine and understanding in him. His life was Christ-like. He lived for Christ. And also, he preached the gospel. And he taught the, the, the gospel of grace. And so he refreshed the saints. And Paul, don't you know that refreshed him? That's, that's just good news for somebody. Paul had given the gospel to him. And here Philemon now, he's matured. And he's got the doctrine in him. And he's giving it out. And that refreshed Paul, refreshed the saints. Because they believe the fact. He believed the facts. And the, the fact, about the facts, when you believe the doctrine, it's going to produce fruit in your life. When I believe, when I say myself, when I believe the doctrine, it will produce fruit. You'll find, too, the edifying as a believer. You know, I'm to think more of your view than myself, but you first. And when you do that, uh, you'll find there's fruit in your life. You'll find that there's peace and joy and happiness as well. And you'll find that uh, you're able to edify. I realize that we've all got a job to edify believers. And we're to build believers up, brothers and sisters in Christ. And sometimes some don't want to let, allow that. But on the other hand, that's our choice. And what you need to understand, Paul, every man, everybody's got free will. Paul had free will. He made a choice to believe the gospel. Philemon had free, free will. He made a choice to believe the gospel. Onesimus had free will, and he also had a choice to believe the gospel. So, you know, people say, well, why do so many people come and go in the assemblies? Why? And people want to point and always say, well, it must be the preacher's fault. Well, let me say this to you. Every man and woman, boy and girl, has got a free will. Everybody makes a choice to come or go. I don't do it. You make the choice. I make the choice. I made the choice to come today. So 
you know, it's not hard to figure out why people come and go because they've got free will, they make the choice. You know, you get up today, you made the choice to come, and I thank the Lord for you. The ones that listen on the internet, the internet, they'll make the choice to listen. So we've all got a free will. Well, Paul says in Philemon verse 7 there, he said, For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because of the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Notice the bowels of the saints. When you think about the bowels, that's something that's deep down in your soul. The bowels of the saints are refreshed by the brothers. So Philemon, he's got the doctrine. And you think about Romans, and I'll share this with you again. You think about the first 11 chapters of Romans. I've been spending the last several days and weeks now in Romans chapter 1, and I finished it yesterday, going back over it and studying it for my own benefit and, and taking notes and redoing some things in my mind, renewing things. But you think about Romans chapter 1 through chapter 11. You got the first eight chapters. You ought to put the doctor, we put the doctor in us. That's who we are in Christ. You're justified. We're all sinners. First chapters there tells you that. But we're justified when you believe the gospel. You're saved. And then it talks about our, our, our walk, our progression, and all that. But when you get to chapters 9, 10, and 11 of Romans, I know that I'm not Israel when I read those chapters. That's what you learn. You got the doctrine in you in the first eight chapters. Well, when you get to Romans 9, 10, 11, Paul talks about Israel and makes it very clear that the body of Christ, we're not Israel. So there's the doctrine. But then you get to chapter Romans 12 through 16, there's duty there for me. There's responsibility. I'm under grace. So that means I've got responsibility. That means that I have, to, I have to practice. I want to practice the doctrine. I've got it in me. Why wouldn't I want to practice it if you put the doctrine in me? So the doctrine is what motivates you. Let me give you an example. Turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Give me an example of what I'm talking about on this. Philippians chapter 1. And look at verse 9. Paul's praying for these believers. Philippians 1 9. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. That's Philippians 1 9 and 10. Now you notice there in Philippians 1 9, Paul's praying, and this I pray that your love may abound yet more, yet more and more in knowledge. Notice that. Well, when you get you you get the knowledge, what are you getting? You're getting the facts. You're getting more information. You're reading the Word. You're putting the doctrine in you. You're gaining, getting the facts and the knowledge, information. <coughs> and when you do that, he's praying also in an old judgment in Philippians 1. <coughs> What's that judgment? People say, well, I'm, you're not supposed to judge. This is talking about there's a judgment here that we need to judge. In an old judgment. Discernment's what that means there. And we're praying, you know, Paul's praying that they'll get, uh, that they'll, in verse 9 there, that, uh, and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. And that judgment is discernment. You discern, you're clear of things that should not be in your life. And you're discerning that. And you know, you know as well as I do, as you've been, since you've been saved, that maybe there's some things that's come in your life it's not being clear to you like it should because you don't have the doctrine in you like, like you should. And so that makes it a little cloudy for you. You don't see things. So no, notice clear things that should not be there in our lives. Well, how? What, what are we going to go by to determine what shouldn't be in our life? Should we go on what the preacher says? No. Should we go on what the denomination teaches? No. What should we go on? Or the Word of God. That's what you go on. That's what determines, that's how you judge and you discern and you judge what's the things that you don't need in your life. And this is clear right here. Go back to Galatians chapter 5. Notice some of these things. You know, preachers, they want to talk about years back, they, I know for example, uh, they talk about smoking and drinking. That would be the, the whole message. 
Well, let me show you here. In Galatians chapter 5, here's some things that shouldn't be in my life or in your life as well. Galatians 5, 19. In Galatians 5, 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. And these first four here are the sexual things here. And these first four things listed. Then he says idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, bearing, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, rebellion, and such like of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So you think about the works of the flesh, and you think about those first four in verse 19 there. Hold your place there, and here's an example. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, and look at verse 11. This is a good verse for you to mark down beside that. 1 Peter chapter 2, and look at verse 11. We read in Galatians 5, 19 about adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Well, look at 1 Peter 2 and verse 11. 1 Peter 2, 11. Uh, Peter says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. See, that's what happens when people are caught up in that. There's, it wars against the soul. Well, your soul is in your inner man. And it wars against that when you're caught up and you're guilty of that. And the uncleanness part. And you can go all the way back to Romans 1 and, and talk about that. It happened with the Gentiles in Genesis 11 all the way up through there. So I won't get off on that today, but you, you, think, you think about all that and understand this, in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, it tells you some things that I shouldn't be caught up in. I should be able to judge and know, hey, these things are wrong. I shouldn't, I shouldn't want them in my life. They should not be in my life. Get rid of it is what it amounts to. So... Look at Romans chapter 12, for example. Romans 12 and verse 9. <laughs> Romans chapter 12 and verse 9. So get rid of sin. I mean, you be able to judge, be able to discern what's right and what's not right for your life. And you do that with the Word of God. You read it, you believe what the Word says, and this is what it says, so I'm going to do it. That's like Romans 12, 9. Paul says, you know, you get to Romans 12 now, you ought to have the doctrine in you. And Paul was writing now, practice the doctrine, Romans 12, 9, let love be without dissimulation. But abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Notice that abhor. Well, what's that mean? It means to get rid of. Here's your verse. Turn to Psalm 119 and verse 163. Psalm 119. And verse 163. We'll let the Bible define that word of horror. Psalm 119, 163. Psalm 119, 163. I hate and abhor lying. Notice that. But thy law do I love. I hate and abhor lying. When, you know, you think about a whore, you hate it. Get rid of it. And so that's what Paul said there in Romans 12, 9 there. Uh, but let, uh, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. But you notice what it says. Cleave to that which is good. You know, cleave to it. Bring, bring good in. That's what you want. Uh, why am I doing this? Well... You go back, why, why do I want good brought in? Why do I want sound doctrine brought in my inner man? Go back to Philippians chapter 1. We should have held a place there. Philippians chapter 1, look at verse 10. Paul's praying for these believers. He's praying that they'll, they'll uh, abound yet more and more knowledge and all judgment, verse 9. But Philippians 1.10, notice this. Why do we want good? Well, in Philippians 1.10, that ye may approve things that are excellent. Well, what would the word excellent mean? Greater value. You think about greater value. That ye may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ. So that, we want things of greater value. And we want good. 
and the good would be greater value as well. So going back to Philemon verse 8, Philemon verse 8, Notice what Paul says in Philemon verse 8 as he writes this to Philemon. Right in Philemon verse 8, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. Now, the wherefore, that's because of the doctrine working in you. Already we've done talked about that in the previous verses. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. Well, Paul brings up his apostolic authority now. All of us know he's our apostle. Philemon knew he was his apostle. And he brings up the apostolic authority. And you'll say, well, how do you see that in that verse? Well, read the verse. Philemon, verse 8. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. What do you think the word enjoin means? To enjoin it means to order or direct somebody. That's what it means. So, you know, Paul's the apostle. He said that wherefore though I might be much bold in, in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. So Paul brings up his apostolic authority, but Paul didn't make Philemon forgive Onesimus. He didn't do that. You'll notice that there, Onesimus did Philemon wrong, but Paul didn't, didn't make Philemon forgive him. You know, in scriptures, in the scripture, forgiveness is not an option. It's not. When you read the Word of God and you've got the doctrine in you, it's not an option. You've got to forgive. And, and you hear people all the time say, I just can't forgive so and so, they've done so much to me. How much did Christ, what did He do for us? So it's not an option. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And look at verse 12. And I'm speaking to myself. You know, if it doesn't affect you, I mean, if you're not bothered with it or you don't have any issue with it, it's fine. But we, I do, and I think we all have issues. It's hard sometimes. Flesh doesn't want to forgive. Remember that. That flesh doesn't want to do that. Your flesh has got emotions. And that's what the flesh wants to run our lives by emotions. <coughs> Colossians chapter 3, look at verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Now, when you read verse 12, don't just skip over our titles that we have. Put on therefore as the elect of God. That's one of our titles as a believer. Holy, that's another title. And beloved, that's another title. Those three titles, that's who we are. But you'll notice in verse 13 there, uh, if it, the last part of that verse, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Have you ever heard of anybody not having a quarrel with anybody? No. We've all gone through things ourselves with people. Whether you want to or not, you do. So, did Philemon have a quarrel with Onesimus? And the answer is yes, he did. Colossians 3.13 says, the last part of that verse, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So, biblical forgiveness is not an option. And you think about that. Paul's telling Philemon to put the second, put the sound doctrine on display. Put it on display. You know, what's, what's convenient there? You read that word in verse 8 there, you see the word convenient? Or verse Go back to Philemon, I'm sorry, Philemon verse 8. I'm about to get ahead of myself. Philemon verse 8. Paul says, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ and join thee that which is convenient. Well, what's convenient? That's telling you what to do. Because you get the idea in that same verse, the word enjoin there is to order or, or direct somebody to do something. That, that which is convenient. Now he's talking about telling you what to do. You know, the thing about sound doctrine, and that's what Paul preached. 
Sound doctrine doesn't tell people what to do. And you know why? Because everybody's got a free will. You've got a choice to make. And you make the choices, not me. And I, I tell you, when I've learned, since I've learned this, I've had experience with some people that I could have tried to have dominion over, and that's not the right way to do it. And I didn't. I let them make their own choices, and they made them. And there's wrong choices. Can I change it? I can't change it. Man's got to make their own choices. So that's, that's what I'm telling you. We've all got choices to make. Like, for example, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 24. My job is not here to preach and put you under the law. My job is not trying to have a minion over you. My job is to preach the word, preach the sound of edify, build up the saints. 2 Corinthians 1.24. In 2 Corinthians 1.24, Paul says, Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. So, Paul's telling the Corinthians, Not for that we have dominion over your faith. Paul didn't have dominion over them, but are helpers of your joy. That's what Paul was to those Corinthians. For by faith ye stand. Now, how do you get to faith? Romans 10, 7, 17. So, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. You read the Word of God. Rightly divided. You build up that doctrine in you. Romans 2, 5, Laman. You build that up and that, that's how you stand in the position who you are in Christ. But nobody has dominion over you. Man doesn't have dominion over you. You've got a free will. You make choices. And that's what Philemon had to do. Go back to Philemon verse 9. Philemon in verse 9. Notice what Paul says in Philemon 9. Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the age, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Notice that yet for love's sake. Well, why didn't Paul command Philemon? Why didn't he just command him? We just got the reason why you don't have dominion over people. And Paul knew that because Paul wanted to be from the true motivation of grace. That's why. You know, whenever you let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, you build up that doctrine in your inner man, then you make the decision. You make the choices. Nobody influences you to do that. And that's why... You think about the love of Christ constraineth us, 2 Corinthians 5, 14. And you think about that. The motivation of grace is not a command nor a demand. It's not that. You do it because you love Him. Philemon, you do it because you love Him. The doctrine will make you do it. And I, I, I see that in my life now. The doctrine makes me do because... I know how much the Lord loves me. I love Him, but I could never love Him as much as He loves me. So, the doctrine built up in me energizes me. And it, it, it works effectually in me, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. And when you read that word in Philemon verse 8, about Paul there, it says, uh, Wherefore though I might be much bolder in Christ, well, verse 9, Sorry. Yet for love's sake, I'd rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul, the age, and it's talking, not, talking about his old age. That's what, not what the context is here. Uh, Paul's not a, Paul was, uh, it's not about his, uh, being an old man in this verse. Paul's a seasonal soldier for, for the truth. How do we know that? By reading the Bible. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Not far from there. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul is a seasonal soldier for the truth. And you look at 2 Timothy 2 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Notice that endure hardness. If you look at chapter 4, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6. This is before Paul dies, 2 Timothy 4 6. For I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. There's a soldier there. I finished my course. I kept the faith. 
See, he's a soldier. And it's not talking about age there as far as old wise. Paul is not a beginner. So Philemon verse 10, Paul says to Philemon, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Notice the words I beseech there. Have you seen that like that in Romans 12, 1? You have because you build the doctrine up in, in your Romans chapter 1 through 11. And then Paul says, I beseech you. What's he beseeching the believers for in Rome? Present their body a living sacrifice. You can do that. That's love motivation. Let the doctrine work in you, Philemon, when I beseech you. That's what Paul's telling him. Display who you are. Why should Philemon do that? Well, for the church to see it, one reason. And for the world to see it. That's another reason. I mean, you want the doctrine to build up in you for all of the saints here to see that in you. You want the doctrine to build up in you so your neighbors can see it. Whether they do good or do bad, you want to set an example before your neighbor and everybody else. You want the world to see you. You know, and we ought to remember this, and I'm sure we do. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 20. And you, you should remember this every day when you get up. 2 Corinthians 5, 20. Notice what Paul says. He's writing to Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 20. He says, For then we're ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. Now what are we? He's telling those Corinthians, now, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. Well, an ambassador is a representative. We represent the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way that I can represent Him is to build that doctrine up in me. And, that's, and display that. And that's why displaying our lives, representing the Lord. Uh, one thing Paul, about Philemon, when he writes this little letter, Paul never said what Onesimus did was right or wrong. He didn't say that. But he wrote the letter to Philemon. Paul's talking about Philemon's reaction and response to Onesimus coming back. That's what he's talking about when he writes the letter. And the question is, was Onesimus wrong? what he did to Philemon? And the answer is yes, he was. Philemon was a businessman. And there's probably no doubt Onesimus cost him a lot of money by leaving and doing what he did. But you know what happened to Onesimus? He heard the gospel and he was saved, believed the gospel. So, you know, forgiveness, going back to that, you think about, you think about uh, Philemon, o Onesimus, uh, worked for Philemon. He ran away. Cost him a lot of money. Then he got saved. And what's, what does Philemon need to do? Well, um, I, you owe me $5,000 or you owe me $10,000. I can never forgive you. That's what you hear today. That's human viewpoint. Well, what do you have to do? Well, if you've got Pauline doctrine built up in you, what do you have to do? You've got to forgive. That's what you got to do. And I wrote down forgiveness in Scripture. It has to do with you giving up your right to hold someone else wrong. That's what forgiveness is. You give up your right. You giving up your right to hold someone else wrong. You don't just keep pointing your finger, finger all your life and die go out of this little world, and you're still pointing your finger so and so. You did me wrong. You know you're done wrong all the time. And we do wrong ourselves. Well, what's the biblical forgiveness? It's an act of our faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. You put the doctrine in. Philemon's got the doctrine in. Romans, there to Titus. He knows it. He understands it. He's got the doctrine. And we choose to give up our right to hold another person accountable for the wrong they've done. You know, what happens when you don't forgive someone? Well, you know as well as I do, there's misery in your soul. And I can tell you, things happened to me early in my life as a preacher. Uh, I, I can tell you, and I won't mention names or go into detail, but people will hurt you. And it will affect you all your life if you don't get rid of it. And I can tell you that for myself. That's why I go back to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And look at verse 13. Colossians 3.13. 
In Colossians 3.13, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. You got to forgive. If you got the doctrine in them, in you, you will. Uh, what you know, you always think about what Christ did for us. He gave He gave up the right to hold us accountable for what we did, so that we could be saved. And. You know, people say, well, I've been, uh, this person's done me so much wrong and I, I, I've been hurt so much. Well, it does hurt. It does bother you. It does well in your mind. But the only thing that's going to help you is put the doctrine in and get rid of it. That, you may have it pop up, the old flesh. It may come up, the old nature sometimes. But you think about what Christ has done for us. He died and shed his blood. You know, I was looking at this in Romans. Go back over there, right? Romans chapter 1. Quickly, and I'll, I'm going to give you something. You think about Romans chapter 1, and you read, I'm going to give you these verses here. We're not going to read them. Romans chapter 1, you look at verse 18 through the end of the chapter 32 there. And what's man doing? Willfully rejecting God's testimony. That's what man's doing. And you look at Romans chapter 2. Verses 1 through 11, what's man attempting to do? To be self righteous. That's what man's trying to do. It's not in your notes. Uh, Romans 2 12 through 16, what man gives an excuse? I did not know the law. That's, uh, that's an excuse. I can give you these if you need them later. Then in Romans 2 17 through 29, what's man doing? He's his living in hypocrisy. He's hypocritical. Then you get to Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Man accuses God. That's what man does. Then you look at Romans 3, 9 through 12. Man's lack, lack of character. <clears throat> Don't have any character. And then you get on down to Romans 3, 13 through 18. Romans 3, 18, uh, 13 through 18. We're all guilty. Every one of us. And the conclusion is, Romans 3.19, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them run the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. And that's what it is. Man's guilty. And you know, I had to be saved, just like you. And you think about forgiveness. You know, it's, it's our duty, you know, to forgive. It's not, it's not an option. And... You think about feed the enemy. How can you feed somebody if you haven't forgive, forgiven him? <laughs> you know, when you, you think about that. So, I just encourage you today, display your life. I want to display my life. Put on display who we really are in Christ. Even though man does you wrong and it may hurt, display Christ in your life.